On this video, we will show you some of the best things to do in Edinburgh, part 2. So if you haven't seen part 1 yet, make sure to check that out after this video is done. Standing on top of Castle Rock, Edinburgh Castle is visible from many parts of the city. There has been a royal castle there since the 12th century, and it was a royal residence up until 1633, when it began being used for military barracks as well as prisons for POWs. This castle was involved in many conflicts such as the Wars of Scottish Independence and the Jacobite Rising of 1745. In 2014, researchers identified 26 different sieges in its 1100-year history making it the most besieged place in Great Britain and one of the most attacked in the world. After so many sieges, only a few of the present buildings in Edinburgh Castle predate the 16th century, such as St. Margaret's Chapel, which is the oldest building in Scotland, as well as the Royal Palace and the Great Hall. The Great Hall was completed in 1511 for King James IV. The wooden roof and beams are amazing. And here you can also see where grand banquets and events took place, as well as many weapons and armor. Inside the National War Museum and Regimental Museums, you'll see swords, guns, war uniforms, medals, and much more war memorabilia. These museums display many artifacts used by Scottish forces over many centuries. There's a lot to see in here, so be sure to plan to spend a few hours here to see everything. The one o'clock gun is a tradition that dates back to 1861, and it was used to help ships in the Firth of Forth set their clocks at 1 p.m. The gun is fired every day except on Sundays, Good Friday and Christmas. The prisons of war display was probably one of the most interesting parts of the castle to us, and especially the kids. This is where pirates and prisoners were once held in the vaults below Crown Square in the 17 and 1800s. Nearly 1,000 prisoners were kept here. This is a recreation of how they would have looked back then. Prisoners came from France, America, Spain and other European countries. Many of the Americans were those having fought in the War of Independence. There is even an early depiction of the stars and stripes scratched into the door. We didn't see this when we were there, but found this photo online. Caribbean pirates were also held here before it became a prison in the early 1700s, and they were eventually sentenced to death in Hong. The famous Stone of Destiny used in coronations of kings and queens of Scotland and England, along with crown jewels, are also located here. Filming inside is not allowed. Mary, Queen of Scots, gave birth to her son, James Charles Stuart, here in 1566, who then became James VI as King of Scotland and James I for England and Ireland. He is the same King James who sponsored the translation of the Bible into English, which is now known as the King James Version. Since we entered the castle at 11.30 a.m. and had been walking around for a good while, we decided to try the tea rooms as the kids were starving. Even though there was an hour wait time, the food was very delicious and well worth the wait. This was also my first time having tea with milk and I actually really enjoyed it. the afternoon tea and delicious sandwiches and hot chocolate. We ordered the afternoon tea sampler as well as a soup and sandwiches for the kids. This was our first time actually having afternoon tea in Scotland and we really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. 
the prices for the food in the menu were actually pretty affordable for being a tea room inside Edinburgh Castle. They were already getting the stand set up for the annual Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo, where for three weeks the castle hosts a series of military tattoos performed by the British Armed Forces, Commonwealth and international military bands and display teams. An interesting fact about the castle is that it actually sits on the plug of an ancient volcano, now known as Castle Rock. The Royal Mile is a succession of streets that run from Edinburgh Castle all the way down to Holyrood House, two important locations in the history of Scotland. The total length of the streets is exactly one mile, and if starting from Edinburgh Castle, the first part of the street is Castle Hill, and it ends with Cannon Gate near Holyrood Palace, and is the busiest tourist street in all of Edinburgh. As soon as you exit the castle, you will see the Camera Obscura in World of Illusions exhibit, as well as the Scotch Whiskey Experience and a few famous restaurants. The Royal Mile offers a huge variety of gift shops that sell kilts, cashmere and lots of Scotland souvenirs, as well as restaurants, pubs and other visitor attractions. There's also no shortage of street performers either, and most of the time there will be a bagpiper playing that beautiful Scottish sound. If you like our videos, please like and subscribe. The Highland Tollbooth Kirk, now known as The Hub, is a new Gothic style building built between 1842 and 1845. The interior is now a multifunctional space where many different events are held. Even though it has the appearance of a church, it was never actually really consecrated as one because the Church of Scotland had it built to function as the meeting place of the General Assembly. Near the corner of High Street and Canongate, you will find a famous World's End pub. Also in Canongate, there's a delicious fudge shop called the Fudge House. They offer lots of flavors such as Highland Cream, Butterscotch, Caramel, as well as a huge variety of chocolate flavored that it makes it hard to choose. So we just got a box with the varieties and chose 10 different flavors. My 
favorite flavor was Rocky Road. They also have several ready-made gift packages and even fudge candied nuts. Along the Royal Mile, there are several closes that refer to small alleyways or courtyards. Bakehouse Close is famous because this is where a few scenes from Outlander were filmed. These stairs were used as the entrance to Jamie's print shop in Season 3, as you can see here. It was changed quite a bit and spruced up with lots of props to make it look like 18th century Edinburgh. As well as the background, you can see there was some CGI done. And this part of the alley is where Claire walks through after she travels through the stones to the 18th century and find Jamie. Located at the bottom of the Royal Mile, where Cannon Gate ends, you will find Holyrood Palace, the Queen's official residence in Edinburgh and the home of the Scottish royal history. Queen Elizabeth II will spend one week here in the beginning of every summer and so the palace is open to the public most of the year, with the exception of when members of the royal family are in residence. We decided not to visit it this day because we had spent most of the day in Edinburgh Castle. However, we did go into the gift shop and purchase the kids a few things. Carlton Hill is located close to Holyrood Palace and the Scottish Parliament building. It is also the location of several monuments and buildings, including the National Monument, the Nelson Monument, the Dugald Stewart Monument, the City Observatory, and a few others. This Greek-looking construction is the National Monument of Scotland and is a memorial to soldiers who died in the Napoleonic Wars. It was designed in 1823 to 1826 and modeled upon the Parthenon in Athens, but due to lack of funds, it was left unfinished in 1829. Alton Hill offers some amazing views of Edinburgh and is definitely worth a visit. The Dugald Stewart Monument is a memorial to the Scottish philosopher Dugald Stewart and it was completed in 1831. The Nelson Monument was built between 1807 and 1816 to commemorate Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson's victory over the French and Spanish fleets at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. It was built at the highest point of Calton Hill and measures 32 meters high. 
the Carlton Hill Observatory used to be an astronomical observatory, and as of 2018, it has become a contemporary art center and a restaurant. Arthur's Seat is an extinct volcano and is the main peak among the seven hills in Edinburgh. Therefore, many visitors enjoy it for hiking and walking. Some areas of the mountain are a bit more challenging than others and require a permit to rock climb. To walk to the summit of Arthur's Seat, it normally takes between 30 minutes and 60 minutes depending on where you start from. No one knows for sure how this extinct volcano hill got its name. Some say this was Camelot, the legendary home of King Arthur. It does offer some very nice panoramic views of Edinburgh. The National Museum of Scotland is free to enter and can be a great option for something to do with children. It is located on Chambers Street and is very close to Greyfriars Bobby in the Kirkyard. The Grand Gallery has a lot of animals and skeletons of prehistoric animals displayed, and it is very cool to look at. Other exhibitions include the discovery through the history of Scotland, explore the wonders of nature, art and design, science and technology, and world cultures all under one roof. We won't show you everything here, but if you're there and interested, make sure to check this place out. If you get hungry, there is a cafe inside the museum where you can buy some food and sweets as well as have a great view of the Grand Gallery. I'm driving the car very fast. The Family Interactive Galleries is a very fun space for the kids. Here they can go and explore and interact and learn with the wonders of the natural world through puzzles and more. We had a lot of fun in the kids area. And the most famous sheep in the world Dolly is here. She was the first ever cloned mammal. St. Giles Cathedral, or the High Kirk of Edinburgh, is a parish of the Church of Scotland. The current building began in the 14th century and had significant alterations done in the 19th and 20th centuries. These banners show all the present knights who belong to the Order of the Thistle. And the glass windows are considered to be the best Victorian stained glass windows in all of Scotland. The architecture is beautiful to look at, with amazing arches and so many beautiful details everywhere you turn. This stunning organ was installed recently in 1992. You can also see the blue colors of Scotland's flag on the restored ceilings. In 1559, the church became Protestant with John Knox 
the foremost figure of the Scottish Reformation, as its minister. It is thought that without John Knox and his leadership, the Reformation may have never happened in the mid-1500s. If you haven't yet, check out our other Scotland videos on our channel after this. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to watch part 3 where we explore the outer skirts of Edinburgh, as well as our part 1 video which is already posted. Also, if you are already subscribed to our channel, thank you so much. And if you're not, we would be honored if you would click that subscribe button as well as turn on the notifications to help us reach our first 500 subscribers.